Amen. Amen. Well, we can never say it enough when, of course, wish all of our fathers a happy Father's Day. Uh, this is your day, and I pray that you are affirmed and acknowledged for the role you play, uh, God's role you play in your family and in the life of, of the uh, children, because I think it's important for us to recognize that um, it, there is a need for fathers now more than ever before. And I want to just encourage all of our fathers, we, we know there's no playbook for fatherhood. Um, and we do the best we can day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. And so uh, but we're thankful for every man who's fulfilling that fatherhood role because it does make a difference in the next generation. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, let's um, get ready to go into our message. Please take out your, your, your mobile device and pull up your, your note sheet so that you can follow along in the message. Because we're in lesson number three of this series we've entitled Persistence. And what we've been looking at along this journey is how manifestation of our victory goals can't happen unless we are persistent. Just because you get a promise from God does not mean that the goal automatically happens. There is human effort that must be put into it. And for many of us, when we've seen our whole lives turned upside down, we've seen our country and our world turned upside down over the last several months, you may think that this is a lost year and that whatever you had planned for this year, you'll just roll it over until 2021. But what I want you to know is that if you will remain persistent, God will fulfill his promise in your life and show you victory 2020. So don't allow yourself to be tricked into thinking that you got to wait for next year. And so we t started out in this series talking about how you had to get ready to fight. That if you're going to really win, you have to have a fighter's mentality. You have to have a commitment that says, I'm going to keep my eye on the prize, and whatever obstacle comes in my way, I am not going to let myself become distracted. I'm going to get ready to fight. Last week, we talked about how fatigue sets in and how you get weary along the journey and how it's important for us to stay in the fight. And what we did was we used the parable that Jesus taught of this widow who was seeking redress from an unjust judge, and she would not let it go until she got the result that she was looking for. And Jesus praised this woman and, and said that, that she saw justice from an unjust judge, but how much more? Will those of us who cry out to God for justice, won't he give us that justice swiftly? So God is working for us. And as we're fighting, we saw in lesson one that God is fighting with us and God is fighting for us. But what we cannot be ignorant about is there is someone who's fighting against us. And whenever you're at a point where you're ready to give up, where you're entertaining thoughts of failure and a quitting, whenever you just feel exhausted and just think you can't make it one more day, whenever negative thoughts are pervading your mind, that's the time for you to recognize who's really doing the talking. And so I want you to see today from looking at a, a familiar biblical person called Job and what happened to him, that as much as God has confidence in you, there's a devil that exists, and his primary purpose is to derail you. And so my message to you today, and, and, I, and from my heart to every father's heart, is don't let the devil win. Don't let him win. So let's look at this passage now from the book of Job. God is holding court in heaven, and the angels come before him. And in comes the devil, and God sees the devil hiding among the angels and says, Hey, what have you been doing? Where have you come from, the Lord asked Satan. And Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth. So you need to understand that the devil is busy. That's not just a religious phrase. It's true. He's always busy trying to disrupt things. He's watching everything. He's not trying to uh, 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 overlook some things. He's looking for any opportunity, any weakness, any opening that he can find. And so the Lord said to Satan, he asked him, have you noticed my servant Job? Now, I suspect if Job were privy to this conversation, he probably would say to God, hey, listen, 
Um, don't praise me. Don't have confidence in me. But because of how Job lived, and I believe this is how God looks at all of us. God said to Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He's blameless, a man of complete integrity. God is bragging on Job. And I believe as God's dear children, all of us, God brags on us because he sees the potential in us. Notice he never says Job was perfect, that he was completely without sin. He was blameless from a, a spiritual perspective, but it wasn't that he was perfect because he couldn't have been perfect because he was human. But God saw something in him worthy of praise, and God was praising him. And he goes on and says, Job fears God and stays away from evil. This is an upright man, a just man, a moral man. The characteristics of how we as fathers ought to operate. And when Satan sees a father who's trying to do the right thing, I need you to hear me. Satan replied to the Lord, yes, but Job has a good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. So Satan hates the fact that God watches over us. He hates the fact that God puts a wall of protection around those he loves and the property and home of those that he loves. Satan goes on and says, you have made him prosper in everything he does. Notice the, can you just hear the envy dripping from his words? He's like, yeah, you're doing all of this for them. And what is implied is, but you didn't do any of that for me. Look how rich he is, but reach out and take away everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Now, what the devil didn't understand, so I'm going to get you to the end of the story so before we go back and fill out the points. What the devil didn't understand was that Job loved God, not for the things God did for him, Job loved God for who God is. And that's the difference between a man of the world and a man of God. A man of God may have things and be blessed with things, but those things are never greater than the God who gave them. And so the devil had a plan to come after Job to try to prove to God that his confidence in Job was misplaced. And men, I believe that the devil does that same thing with all of us. God sees us as the apple of his eye. He sees us as men of God. He sees us as men of integrity. And the devil says, oh yeah, that's what you think, God? Well, let me throw some chaos in their lives and see if you're still proud of how they operate. So I want you to understand that as you're living your life, as you're trying to do the best you can do with what you know and how to operate, you need to be assured and you need to understand. Point number one, the devil is your enemy. He cannot be trusted. You should not ever listen to a word he says. When he whispers in your ear, when he agitates your emotions, all he's trying to do is get you off the path of victory onto the path of destruction. And we will either cooperate with him in our destruction or we will stand against him for our victory. Now understand right up front, the devil is not equal to God. So I am not trying to glorify the devil. I'm trying to help you understand that you do have an adversary who tries to trick you into forfeiting the victory that God has promised you. And my advice to you is the same advice that Peter gives. He says, stay alert. In other words, be on your guard. Don't become so comfortable 
that you don't think that the devil will try to destroy you because he will. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion. He's always lurking. He's always moving. He's always trying to find an opening where he can jump on you. And as long as you don't leave yourself vulnerable, the devil can never get you to get off your path. Will he try? Absolutely. Will he keep on trying? Absolutely. But will he succeed? No, as long as you recognize him for who he is and stay close to God. Because he's going around like a roaring lion and he's looking for someone to devour. Just make sure that someone isn't you. Stand firm against him. That, that's all we have to do. Stand firm against him and be strong in your, in your faith. That's what God wants us to do. But you're not doing it alone because Peter goes on and says, remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. Other people who are living for God are dealing with the same type of attacks and assaults. But he helps us understand that we're not alone. When we're standing firm, there are others who are standing firm with us. The devil, and we heard this from Jesus in John 10, 10, he comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But he can't do any of that without our cooperation. So why would you cooperate with someone who's trying to destroy you? We can't let the devil win. He only wins if we stop staying alert. Please hear me, church. If we're going to have a fighting spirit, a victorious spirit, a persistent faith, it will only happen when we recognize who our true enemy is. Your enemy is not another person. I need to say this. <laughs> In the marriage context, your enemy is not your spouse. Your, your enemy isn't your children. Your enemy isn't your boss. Your enemy isn't society. Your enemy is always the devil. Now, the devil will use people, but the source of it comes straight from the pit of hell. Are you all hearing me today? And so here's what Jesus said to Peter. He said to him, Simon, which is another name for Peter, stay on your toes. Satan has tried his best to separate all of you from me. That's what he wants to do. Yeah, you think just reading your Bible and praying in the morning and all that. Yes, oh God, I love you and you worship and you sing your worship songs. You have the Christian station on in the car. You don't realize that everything you do to draw closer to God, the devil is trying to find a way to separate you from God. Because if he separates you from God, you become an easy, vulnerable target. That's why if you stop praying... That's why if you stop staying in the word, if you stop saying the declarations over your life, if you stop those spiritual disciplines that draw you closer to God, all you're doing is putting a bullseye on yourself and saying, come get me devil. And you know what the devil's going to do? He is going to come and get you. And then you're going to wonder, what happened? Why this happened to me? And you know what instinctively we do? We don't blame the devil. And we don't blame ourselves. We say, God, why did you let this happen to me? And God is saying, I didn't. You moved. I was protecting you. And you moved from near me and left yourself vulnerable. So his advice to Simon was this. I've prayed for you that you do not give in or give out. I want you to know today 
Jesus is praying for us. He knows where we're vulnerable. He knows how we're tempted. He knows where our, our breaking points are. But what his prayer is, is that we do not give in or give out. That we stay in the battle. That we stay focused on victory. And then he tells Peter, when you have come through the time of testing, turn to your companions and give them a fresh start. See, whatever you've gone through in life, the challenges you faced, they aren't meant just to sit on the shelf and be your own private little, little thing that you nurture. No, when you've gone through something, that means God wants to use that so you can help somebody else. We have to stop acting like we are so, uh, so perfect and so um, um, inviolable. We have to stop acting like we have everything together. We need to let people know when we've gone through struggles and how we got through the struggles because that testimony is what helps others get through. As long as everybody in the church acts like everything's all right all the time, then we look like we're a bunch of out of touch people who don't live real life. When we all know when we go home, we've got things in our home, things in our family, things in our checking account, things in our doctor's report that we're working through. And if we can just let other people know, I've been there, I've done that. I've got the t-shirt, the hat, and the souvenir mug, and I got through. And if I can get through, so can you. We, we have to take off the masks. And let people see, I've been through the storm, that I've been through the rain, I've seen the devil come against me, but, I, but God made sure he didn't win. And when we start telling testimonies like that, those who don't know our God will look and say, if that's the kind of God you serve, that's the God I want to serve. I don't want a God for perfect people. I need a God for broken people who he helps to become more in his image. So I want to be clear today. When trouble comes, don't blame God. Don't accuse God. And I think God made this thing easy for us, for those of us who are English speakers. I believe God made it so easy. Look at this. When trouble comes, blame the one who has evil in his name. He made it easy for us. You don't have to wonder when you get the negative doctor's report. God, what? No, no, no. Devil, you're a liar. He's, he's the one. You're hearing me. When things come against us, if we blame God, then we're actually opening ourselves up for the devil to come at us even stronger because we've separated ourselves from our source. The devil is our enemy. God is trying to help us if we will let him. Because point number two now, adversity reveals your true character. When testing happens, it shows who you are. It's easy for us to always say all the right things and quote all the right scriptures. And we've become very uh, facile with, with being able to, to just say, oh, yes, yes, you know, I love God. Yes. And we can say all the spiritual aphorisms and all of this stuff. And it sounds nice until adversity comes. But your faith is not pure and tested unless it's been through some adversity. And when you're up against the wall, what comes out of you will determine your true character. And one thing I want to deal with today specifically is this issue of anger. We see a lot of anger in our society right now. And anger is being stoked and advanced and expanded. And everybody's angry about something. And everybody has a grievance about something. But what I want you to understand from the word of God here 
is that if you let anger control you, it'll actually cause you to sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Now, we use this in the context of relationships and marriage, and we say husbands and wives shouldn't go to bed angry. But listen, it's not just for married folk. You've got to find a way in God's presence to release whatever anger comes on you. Because you may have a very happy marriage, but your boss may have made you angry, and you come home angry. Let me tell you, that anger you have at your boss, if it's not dealt with, will manifest in your home. So God wants us to understand that anger, anger situations happen that cause us anger. They will happen. But we have to know how to handle those negative emotions so they don't cause us to sin. Because anger gives a foothold to the devil. When you're angry and you stay angry, the devil says, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, he'll whisper in your ear some other stuff to make you more angry. Because he knows the angrier you get, the more he can manipulate you. And all he's got to do is just keep on feeding you. And your rage grows and grows and grows. And then all of a sudden, you're like a bull in a china, ch uh, china chop. You are tearing up everything. No matter who comes in your presence, you, you're negative. Hey, good morning. What's good about it? You're just mad at everybody. And then you turn that anger towards God. And that's exactly what the devil wants. Because the moment you're angry at God, the devil says, my job is done. I've got them right where I want them. And he can go on to somebody else. Anger produces sin. And sin separates us from God. Now, in your mind, you immediately say, well, I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't do the other. So I must be good. No, 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 no. Listen, here's a simple definition for sin. Sin is anything that displeases God. So none of us can get away from that. <laughs> if there's something we do or there's something we don't do that displeases God, we have sinned. So don't go back to, to Exodus 20 and look at the Ten Commandments and say, I'm good with those ten, so hey. No, 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 no. We have to realize that if, there's, if there are things in our lives that displease God, that's sin. And the devil will exploit them. But if you keep on sinning, it shows that you, man, sometimes Scripture's rough. It shows that you belong to Satan, who since he first began to sin has kept steadily at it. We can't let the devil win. And if we keep on sinning, if we keep on doing things that we know displeases God, we are identifying that we don't belong to God truly. We belong to Satan. So how do we let the devil win? We let the devil win when we give up hope. When we stop believing that things can get better. When you think your best days are behind you. God is a God of hope. In fact, Zechariah 9, 12 calls us prisoners of of hope. So if we give up hope, we've given in to, to, to the devil, and he will beat us every time. If we accuse God, if we blame God for whatever's going on, if we get angry at God, we are letting the devil get the upper hand on us. If you lose your joy, if you can't smile, if you don't have that inner sense of fulfillment that comes only from God, that joy that the world didn't give and the world can't take away, that joy that, holds, that caused you to hold your head up high regardless of what's happening, that joy that caused you to be able to get out of bed when it seems like there's nothing worth getting out of bed for, if you give up that joy, you're letting the devil win. If you break relationships, if you let what you're going through cause you to turn your back on relationships, you're letting the devil win. Because like it or not, we all need people. 
And the person you break a relationship with may very well be someone that is crucial to your own future and destiny. And then lastly, you abandon your purpose. When you, as a believer, stop doing what you know God put you on this earth to do because of what's going on in your life or going on around you, you're letting the devil win. Because you're saying to God, well, my purpose is only as good as good times. But when bad times happen, I'm not doing that. No, if you were, if you were kind and giving and thoughtful before trouble came, if you change up, then you really weren't committed to your purpose. Because if it's your purpose, you do it when the sun is shining as well as when the rain is falling. You don't stop being who God called you to be because of where you are or what you've gone through. So let me give you the, the word of hope here as we close the message out. The word is your victory. The word is your victory. Yeah, the, I, I've, I've spent this message talking about the schemes and plots and plans of the devil because we are in a spiritual battle. But I don't want you to think that you just have nothing to rely on. The word is your victory. The living word, Jesus Christ, and the written word, that Bible you hold in your hands or on your app, that is all you need for victory. When the devil comes against you, all you need is the living word and the written word, and you will always be victorious. Now, that scripture I quoted you earlier from 1 John chapter 3, I left off the last part of the verse about how, you know, sinning continually, we belong to the devil and all of that. But there's a, uh, the last part of the verse you got to see. But the Son of God came to destroy these works of the devil. That as much as the devil does what he does and tries to trick people and tries to exploit your anger and tries to get you in a vulnerable spot, and if you keep on sinning, you, may, you are following and belong to the devil, God lets us know that God, the Son of God, came to destroy these works of the devil. The living word, Jesus Christ, that's why when I see people in, in the culture mocking Jesus, saw somebody with a sign saying, if Jesus comes back again, I'll kill him. I'm like, what kind of foolishness do we have going on? We wonder why things are the way they are. We move from God. God didn't move from us. And until we return to him, we're going to see this foolishness continue because Jesus can destroy Every work of the devil. And then in Matthew, when Jesus was tempted by Satan, Jesus had to go through it just like we do. The Bible says Jesus answered by quoting Deuteronomy. See, he quoted scripture. It takes a steady stream of words from God's mouth. Jesus tried to let the devil know, no, 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 no. You're not going to win with me because the victory that I need comes from a steady stream of the words from God's mouth. Not bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the fathers, how the traditional verse says it. But I like this steady stream. It's a steady stream of words. You have to keep God's word coming into your life every day. So what does that mean for us? Men, as I close, fathers, as I close, here's what it means. On this day, I want you to commit to three things. First, to be a man of prayer. You got to pray for your, 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 your children, pray for your wife, pray for those connected to you, pray for the men and young, and young women that God has put in your life to be a father figure to. But secondly, you got to parent them. You got to be willing to tell them the truth. Truth is now such a, a weird commodity because everybody has their own truth. Listen, there's, right is right and wrong is still wrong. There are no multiple versions of truth. There is one truth. And so we need to be able to parent those God has put into our stewardship. And parenting means you got to point them in the right direction, even when you have to tell them some hard truths about how their life is not in keeping with God's standards. They need that. 
They actually want that. Most kids who've grown up in a disciplinary family at some point in their lives come back and say, thank you. Even if they didn't follow what they were taught, they at least knew where the compass was pointing. And then when they were ready, they could come back to it. You got to pray for them. You got to parent them. And then thirdly, you got to push them. You got to help set them up to fulfill their purpose. And I believe that if we will do these things, the devil won't win in our families or with the next generation. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed.